Today is our second lecture on query optimization. So again, the high level idea of what we're trying to do here today is given a SQL query, we want to generate a uh, physical execution plan for that query that is both correct, meaning it will generate the correct answer we expect, as well as has the lowest cost of all the query plans that we, uh, we, 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 could, we could examine. The, uh, again, we said last class that this is super hard to do because the, the problem of trying to find the optimal query plan is proven to be NP complete. And therefore, even though the name of what we're trying to build is called the optimizer, we're not really ever gonna be able to try to find, in most cases, for at least for complex queries, the true optimal plan. So we, last class, we looked over a, uh, a bunch of different approaches to doing this search. Uh, we first talked talked about how to take uh, use heuristics, um, where you just have these if-then-else statements that are baked in the source code, looking for certain query patterns and applying changes to to the query plan to put it into a, a different form. Then we talked about how to do a combination of the heuristics from the first approach, as well as a cost-based search uh, approach that came from System R from IBM that allows us to find a optimal join ordering. And the key idea here, what makes the, the cost model based one different from here is that the cost model is guiding our search. It's a way for us to approximate the cost of a query plan and then use that approximation to compare one plan versus another. We then talked about how to do a randomized search uh, with simulated nailing or the gener uh, genetic algorithm from Postgres. And as far as I know, again, Postgres is the only one using uh, this third choice here but they only use it for queries that are have more than 13 tables. Otherwise, uh, by default, you get the, the second approach. And then now we talked about the, the movement in the late 1980s, early 1990s towards these optimizer generators, where instead of having uh, imperative code written in C or C++ to do all these steps for the query plan, we can instead write a, uh, our optimizer rules in a high level language then have a compiler generate the optimizer uh, for us. So Starburst was sort of the first one in this space from IBM, and it was using a stratified search, which, which is like this, the heuristics plus the cost-based join search. And then the unified search uh, is doing the, the sort of the, the logical and logical, logical and logical physical transformations all, all in one. And this is what was used in, in Cascades for the paper you guys read. So again, just sort of reiterating uh, the last two points, uh, just repeating myself, the stratified search is where we're gonna have these rules to do the, the logical query plan transformations. And the, the idea of the way this is gonna work is again, there isn't like, there isn't just a list of rules where we apply them one after another. Uh, there's this rule engine for us that's gonna look at the query plan, figure out sort of patterns that would match what, what, is, uh, what rules we've defined, and then fire them off to, to make, make our change. But again, in this first step, it's, it's entirely done without, any, uh, without uh, consulting a cost model, because there is no cost model. Then after this, we do the same uh, cost-based search to map the logical plan to the physical plan. And again, that was the, uh, the IBM technique. For unified search, again, the idea here is that rather than having these two separate stages, you just have a single uh, single search process or single search uh, a procedure that can do both the logical to logical and logical to physical transformations. So no longer do you need the, the separate stages because you're just doing everything all at once, right? So the, and what we'll see when we talk about cascades is that the, this approach is gonna generate a lot of redundant transformations. Um, because again, like in the stratified search, once I get past that first stage, I'm never gonna reconsider those rules again. But in the unified search, it's all combined together. So you may be trying to evaluate the same rule over and over again. Uh, and so you'd have to use memorization to, to identify that you're doing uh, redundant computation or a redundant transformation and use a cache, uh, a cache result rather than applying it again. Again, we'll, we'll cover this in more detail about when we talk as kids. 
The, uh, in addition to whether you want to do unified versus stratified, another, uh, another sort of design decision you have to make in your query optimizer is whether you want to do a top, top down or bottom up optimization. So top down will be cascades and that's where you start with the final outcome that you want. I, I want to join these three tables together and then you traverse down into a uh, search tree and start adding in the uh, operators, the physical operators or logical operators you need to get to that end goal. And you can use the classic branch and bound uh, pruning technique to recognize that if there's a branch that has a, the current cost is greater than the lowest cost you've seen from the, from the, current, op, the current best plan, you know you don't need to, to traverse down into it. The, uh, the dynamic programming technique we saw from system R is, is an example of a bottom-up optimization where you start with nothing uh, at the bottom and you start iteratively adding in the components or the operators that you need for the query plan to get to that end goal. Right? Again, this is, this is the dynamic technique. So the current literature suggests that the dynamic programming bottom-up optimization is better. We'll talk a little bit about today uh, why that's the case. Um, the... In my opinion, from a software engineering standpoint, I feel that I'm able to reason about the unified approach and the top-down approach better. Um, this is what we implemented in our system. <sighs> Again, there's like the research literature and then there's what actually gets implemented in real systems. So uh, you will see that for the paper in two next week, or two weeks from now, or yeah, next week, next Wednesday, uh, that SQL Server actually has the best query optimizer and they're using a top-down uh, cascades approach. But the literature shows that the dynamic programming bottom-up one, bottom one is better. Because again, there's a lot more going on than just you know, whether you're going in either of these directions. The cost model matters a lot. How you're collecting that, uh, the cardinality estimations, all that will contribute to the overall efficacy and quality of the query plans they'll generate and not just you know, what algorithm you're using. All right, so for today's agenda, uh, I want to spend some time beginning talk about how we're going to do logical query optimization. And again, these, the things we'll talk about here are applicable to whether you're doing a stratified or unified search. Then we'll spend time talking about what the cascades, how the cascades optimizer looks like. Uh, and we'll do this in the context as described in the paper I had you guys read, which is a master's thesis from the late, 1980, uh, late 1990s uh, on a query optimizer based on cascade called Columbia. The reason why I had you read that paper instead of the original Cascades paper is because the original Cascades paper is not very good. It doesn't really describe what they're actually doing. They keep banging on about how great it was that they're object oriented because that was in vogue in the, in the early 1990s. Whereas those 30 pages from that Columbia master's thesis uh, I think lays out, in my opinion, the best description of how Cascades actually works and how it's implemented. We'll briefly talk about why uh, some things that dynamic programming can do that Maybe cascades, cascades can't do very easily, at least in the modern implementation uh, as used by the, guy, the hyper guys in Germany. Then we'll talk about a bunch of other sort of optimized implementations that are out there. Again, these will be categorized as whether they're doing dynamic programming or cascades. But again, I just want, to sort of be, want you to be aware of what's out there. And then we'll finish up with a um, quick overview of what's expected starting on Wednesday this week for your project three code review submissions. So again, we'll do two rounds of code submissions or code reviews. So I'll assign you to another group on Wednesday. You submit your code on GitHub, they'll do a code review of, of, of your code and you'll do a code review of, of their code. So I wanna talk about what's sort of expected for you as a student participating in this project for this step, okay? All right, so again, there's gonna be two types of optimizations we can do. There's the logical optimization and, and physical optimization. Logical optimization are changes or transformations that we could apply to the logical query plan that we get from uh, the binder, right? Or uh, further up in our, in, our, in our front end stack that we can apply rules based on matching patterns or certain, um, yeah, certain patterns that we would see in the logical query plan. And we can make changes to the query plan in such a way that we can potentially set ourselves up so that when we do the plan enumeration in the, uh, the physical query optimization step, that we, we could potentially find a, a, the optimal plan more, more easily. So 
It's not always going to be the case that the changes we make here will guarantee that we'll be able to find the optimal plan. But if we know a little bit about how our optimizer works, we know a little bit what our you know sort of plan enumeration algorithm actually is, then we can apply these changes in such a way that we can prepare ourselves accordingly, right? So the important thing to understand about this step, how we're going to distinguish this between the the uh, when we do physical query optimization, is that again because there's no cost model we have no way to determine whether one query plan is better than another. So we don't know whether we take a logical query plan and then transform it to another logical query plan. The, the optimizer at that stage can't say, oh yes, that transformation was a good thing. It's gonna, make a, it's gonna help me generate a query plan with a lower cost. We don't know that. But we know, since, again, since we know some aspects about you know, relational databases or the kind of databases we're trying to run and what our query looks like and how our system actually performs, we can then maybe direct our, our transformations so that we prefer, you know, one plan over another. Okay, but at the end of the day, the important thing is that the, the original plan or the, the new plan we generate after these transformations has to be equivalent to the original plan because it doesn't help us that, yes, we found a faster query if we produce the incorrect result because people will get pissed and then now your database system is considered unreliable or there's something wrong with the data. Like it's hard to, to debug that. So we want to make sure that any changes we make, we ensure that our query is, is equivalent. So I want to go through uh, four different examples of the types of logical query optimizations we, we can do. And this actually comes from uh, Tom, Thomas Neumann, uh, the hyper guy in Germany. He actually teaches a whole class on query optimization and he goes in much more detail over multiple lectures than what I can do in just four lectures. Um, but some of these examples are coming come from from uh, from his, his slides. So we'll see how we can do splits on conjunctive predicates, predicate pushdown, replacing Cartesian products with joins, because again, at the very beginning, all we have are Cartesian products, and then we can finish up with doing projection pushdown. So for, for each of these, we're going to use that same example query we have from last class where we uh, want to do a three-way join between artists, appears, and album to go find all the artists that appeared on my, uh, my, on my remix tape. So at the very beginning, what we're going to get out of the binder, which is essentially just a copy of what comes out of the, the, the SQL parser, is all our predicates are going to be combined together into a uh, single filter clause. So we have uh, three predicate expressions in our WHERE clause. So we would have a single filter expression in our query plan. Again, this is a logical query plan. It's not telling us how we want to execute anything. But we have a sing thing single filter up here that has all three predicates combined to each other. And we do that filter after we've taken the Cartesian product of all of, all of, of, of the three tables. So in order to make it easier for us to then start doing predicate pushdown and other optimizations, on these individual predicate expressions, we want to decompose the filter into uh, multiple filters that each have one, uh, one conjunction of, of, the, of the, the WHERE clause. So we just split it on the AND and we, we get it like this. For ORs, it's a little bit tricky. You can essentially start duplicating the ORs if you have different conjunctions. Uh, NOTs or negations are a little bit tricky as well, but a level, the, the high level idea is essentially the same. All right, so now that we have these, these, these filters like this, we can start moving them in different ways. We can start moving them to separately into uh, different parts of the, of the query plan. So this is how the, the classic predicate pushdown is going to work. And the idea here is then we can, we can move the, uh, the predicate uh, that we have to be after the Cartesian product or at the lowest point we can in the query plan where we have all the information we need uh, or all the attributes that we need for the filter at some point in the, in, in the tree, right? So in this case here, after we do the Cartesian product, we can then apply artist ID equals appears to artist ID, right? We can't do it before on either side because we don't have both the combined tuples, the two tuples together. Same thing for this one up here, but in this case for album.name equals Andy's remix, we can put that immediately after the uh, scan on the album table because we have all the information that we need. So now, now we want to replace all the Cartesian products that we have in our query plan with, uh, with inner joins. And this is pretty simple, right? This is just identifying that, oh, we have a Cartesian product. Right above it, we have a filter that takes the output of the Cartesian product from 
the, the table on the left and the table on the right and combine them together and you know, do our quality match. So we can just replace those Cartesian products for here and here with, a, with the, the join operator. When with the join operator specified where the join clause is, uh, you know, is, is that filter that used to be right above it. And we can do this regardless of whether the, we're using the old, old style SQL where the join is actually in the where clause or sort of the more modern SQL uh, uh, syntax where you have the, the join on clause, right? This, the same idea works, it works in either one. Then the last optimization we can apply is to do projection push, push down. So in, in this case here, uh, you know, th th we're, being, we're being pedantic here about uh, the, uh, you know, what our query plan is going to look like. And in column store, you could, you could implicitly assume somehow that I'm not scanning the entire tuple, maybe I'm just scanning just the columns that I need, but you still need some information to say what actually those columns you actually need to propagate up into the query plan. So in this case here, we can recognize which attributes we actually need uh, at different levels in the tree. And we introduce projection, uh, projection operators to then uh, only propagate up the, just the attributes we need at each step. And so the way you think about this is implicitly there's pipeline breakers here, here, uh, and I guess up above here. But like at the pipeline breaker, we would introduce a uh, introduce the, the 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 projection, and that makes sure that we only propagate the data that you need. And the reason why we don't want to do this all different parts because at the pipeline, if you're doing a push up approach, uh, like in the case of hyper is. You, you're going to take a single tuple and up, ride it up as, many, as far as you can up in the query plan and only materialize it when you get to the pipeline breaker. Other systems are doing volcano are going top down and that, and that the, the boundaries aren't, 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 as, aren't, aren't exactly the same. Okay. Um, and again, sort of, I was sort of saying here, like in this case here, we only need album name and the album uh, ID. So we could have a projection here just to filter out album ID and album name. But again, what'll happen is this filter actually will get combined here with uh, whatever this, this access method here, how we're accessing the tuple. So in, again, we're not, we don't have projections everywhere we could, right? But because somehow it's gonna be implicitly represented this way. All right, so again, these are all logical optimizations. Again, I, I didn't look at a, at a cost model. I just said, I know I wanna do things and I can bake the transformation rules in my optimizer to, to do this, right? Like this one's the most obvious one. If I have a Cartesian product and I have a, a filter that has a join clause right above it, then I can easily just write a rule that combines that. And I don't need to consult a cost model because I know in my data system, a, a inner join's always gonna be pre preferable to a Cartesian product. You almost never, really, you never wanna execute Cartesian products unless you're explicitly told to do a cross join. All right, so now let's talk about how to do uh, physical query optimization. So this is where now we have a logical query plan, we have these logical operators, and we want to transform them into physical operators that we can then either cogen if we're doing compilation or to actually execute on, uh, in, our, in our execution engine. So what are the kind of transformations we're going to want to do? The most obvious ones are going to be things like specifying how we're actually going to access the, the table or the data that we, we were targeting. Right? Are we going to do a sequential scan? Are we going to do an index scan? If, if so, on, on, on the index scan, then which index are we going to pick? We can add additional execution information about how we expect the, the data to be represented or sorted or compressed. Um, choose operating implementations for the joins, like what join algorithm we want to use, how we actually want to do our aggregation. And then in some cases also too, which we won't talk about today, is identifying when you actually want to materialize potentially uh, the, the data for one portion of the query so that another portion, you know, another part of the query plan could actually access it. Like if you're doing a sub query or uh, views or uh, uh, CTEs. So in this stage here, we now need to make sure that we, or we now have to support cost model estimates because now we want to be able to determine is one physical plan going to be better than another and a cost model is going to allow us to do this. So before we go uh, a little bit deeper into, um, into cascades, I want to talk about and how, how we're actually going to do the, these, these, uh, these you know, the physical transformations. Um, we want to sort of have a caveat and say that everything we've talked about so far 
has been sort of the simple case of always doing uh, echo joins or inner, 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 inner joins. Things now, though, become more tricky when you start having, you know, as you see more realistic queries, outer joins, semi joins, or anti joins. Because now we're not always going to be able to make, uh, have symmetrical transformations to allow us to move any operation around, you know, the or, or reorder our, our query plan easily. Because there may be some cases where you, you, you're not actually allowed to do that because that would end, end up with an incorrect query or an, an incorrect result. So let's look at an example here. So say, again, I'm do, now I'm doing a three-way join on A, B, and C, but I'm going to do a left outer join on A and B, and then do a full outer join on C. So what we're, what we're getting into now is how we actually explore the different join orderings that are available to us in a query plan. Um, so we can decide whether we want to maybe join B and C first, or A and, a and C first, and so forth, as we saw in, with system R. But in this particular example, there's actually no join orderings that, that are actually available to us or possible because that would end up with the incorrect state. And this is because we have these outer joins. So in particular, the outer join on A and B, the left outer join on A and B, is not commuted with the outer, the outer join, the full outer join in B and C because I don't know what the value coming out of this join for B will be, for B.val, in order to join it with C. So I have to execute this first because I don't know whether it's going to be a real value or null, right? Because it's in the left outer join. If, if a.id doesn't match anything with b.id, then the portion of b in the combined tuple will just be null. So b.val could be null here. But I don't know that until I actually do this join. So you need a way when we start doing these join reorderings of the plan enumerations to look at the different possible choices to be mindful that there's some cases where I can't do the reordering. And I'm just bringing this up now because I'm gonna show examples where we assume that you, everything's commutative. You assume that everything could be, could be flipped around, but just in the back of your mind, be, recognize that, oh, there, there is additional mechanism we, we need to make sure that we don't reorder things incorrectly. The dynamic programming is a little bit easier to do this because you're having explicit explicit graphs that you know you can 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 move things around. In the case of Cascades, to the best of my knowledge, you need to have additional property enforcers to recognize that that this this reordering is is invalid. So the way we're going to enumerate different plans uh, at a high level, there's two different approaches. There's the transformation approach where you take an existing plan and you start permuting it in different ways to generate new plans that are equivalent to each other. You still have to check to say, make sure that, uh, you check to make sure that the transformation you're doing is valid. Um, and it's almost sort of like a random walk, except that you have these rules to apply them and, and change things uh, in, in sort of a, a directed way. The another approach is, as was used in the uh, dynamic program approach, where you are doing generative uh, enumeration, where you start, you take the, the parts of the query that you want to execute as building blocks and you start graphing them on and constructing the query plan. Again, be mindful that uh, you don't want to add things incorrectly to produce an invalid query plan, but you sort of start with nothing and start adding, adding things. So I'm not saying one way is better than another, but these are just sort of at a high level the two approaches we, we, we could pursue. So the state of the art for, uh, at least for academically, for doing dynamic programming is the method used in hyper where you're doing uh, sort of hypergraph uh, uh, hypergraph uh, generation where you start with you know it's the generative approach where you start adding building blocks to the query one by one and you're checking as you go along whether the change you want to make by adding a piece in is valid or not so uh, this is the approach that's used in hyper this is the approach used in duckdb I don't know of any commercial system that uh, uses this approach. Um, the hyper guys might, might know, but I don't know the answer for this. Um, we, in our system though, we were based on Cascades. So I'm gonna spend more time talking about that. So as I said, there is an original Cascades paper from uh, 1995, but I didn't have you guys read it because like I said, I, I don't think it's very good. It's not that it's not well written, uh, in terms of like English grammar, 
I just don't think as from a, from a pedagogical standpoint for this course, it provides a clear explanation on what Cascades is actually doing. So that's why I had you guys read the, the master's thesis, because in, in my opinion, that's the best ex explanation of Cascades. So what is Cascades? Well, last class we talked about Volcano, and that was a top-down approach for doing a branch and mountain search of adding, uh, adding um, you know, constructing a query plan. Cascades is the sort of third generation uh, optimizer that Gertz Graphy had built. Uh, and this is sort of, uh, again, the this, this, this state-of-the-art approach that at least from what I'm aware of. And so the big difference we're going to do here in Cascades that we didn't do in uh, Volcano is that we're going to, uh, the, the optimizer is going to generate the transformations on the fly as it needs them, rather than pre-computing all possible transformations at every level we go into uh, as we're searching in, into the query plan, right? So in the case of Volcano, what happened is when I went from one group to the next, so one down one level in, in the tree, before I did any evaluation of the possible transformation that I could, or of each transformation I could apply, I generated all possible transformations, uh, which would explode the search base, right? Um, it may be the case that it maybe got stuck in a local minimum and didn't explore the, uh, the, the rest of the tree more, more carefully, right? So the other cool thing that we're going to be able to do in uh, Cascades is that we're going to be able to do uh, simple rewriting of, 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 of multi-expressions or expressions within the query plan um, by just having these functions and be able to apply them without having to do an exhaustive search for all possible combinations of, of how to execute that multi-expression. That would make more sense uh, in a few, more, a few more slides. The basic idea here is like I could have a placeholder to say, here's some lower portion of the tree. I don't know how I'm going to actually implement it just yet, but I don't need to search it just now. I can search other aspects of, of, the, of the tree and use that placeholder. Okay. All right. So uh, for Cascades, the sort of the four main design uh, ideas that they're going to use is that First is that all the, uh, all the optimizations are going to be the simple pair data structures uh, where you contain the pattern that you want to match in your query plan. And then if it matches, there's a rule to fire to do some kind of transformation. And to contrast this with like the heuristic based approach using Postgres, using other systems, we have a bunch of if then else statements. It's always these rules uh, and you know, there's a rule and then, then there's the, then there's the, the so there's the pattern and then there's a rule that does the transformation. And I can do this for the logical, the logical to logical and logical to physical. It's, it's all the same. The next thing is that we're gonna have rules to, uh, to enforce the property requirements we would have on data or sorry, the, on the intermediate results produced by a given operator. And these would be things like the, uh, the, the sorting order, um, you know, they care about compression and other things like that. Like we can enforce those things. And then the rule engine knows that it can apply the transformation if the transformation would end up violating the rule that it has to, be, has to, be, uh, has to maintain. And contrast this with the system R approach where I said that the rules to, to do the enumeration or the search for the join ordering, it had no notion of, of these physical properties of the data. It all had to be baked into the cost model. But now again, in one place, I can, I can define my rule that says, my data has to be sorted this way and make sure that you don't do a transformation that violates that. The next thing is that uh, we can then now also define the priority or the ordering of the rules that, that, that get applied based on these promises. So the way to think about this is that rather than just randomly picking what trans transformation we want to apply at a given level in our tree, we can specify an order and we even actually do this dynamically so that we can identify aspects of our query plan and say, we think these transformations will lead us to the optimal plan more quickly. So apply these transformations first and only evaluate the other ones if we have more time and want to continue searching at, at that level in the tree. And the last one that's important is that they're going to treat the predicates as uh, first class entities in the system that's gonna allow us to do transformations on them just as we, we would do for operators. And this is how we're gonna be able to do all the things that I showed in the beginning, like the predicate push down, uh, uh, projection push, push down, and things like that. Because uh, 
predicate push down is a better example because those again even though they're like a predicates inside the where clause that would normally be baked inside of like a, a select statement or sorry a scan operator we can have our the engine do transformations on them and do other optimizations just as it would with, with, with physical and logical operators and this is actually something we are, we're trying to build now in our own system uh, we had a project in 721 last year where they built a uh, expression rewriter using our cascades engine um, and the, the student that's, that worked on it last year is now working on it this year again to help finish porting it into the new system. So we won't talk about this today, but this allows you to do certain things like if I have a where clause that says where one equals one, we can rewrite that into uh, just to be true and instead of having to evaluate the, the, the query tree um, in its entirety for every single tuple. Now we compile with LLVM, so the LLVM compiler can easily wipe that away uh, by doing constant folding, but the, the, these are the kind of things we can do now though inside the same cascades framework that we normally would use for optimizing uh, query trees All right, so the first thing we got to talk about to understand cascades is what an expression is So this part is a bit confusing because normally I've been talking about expressions in terms of the you know, the predicates that are in where clauses or join clauses or, or, or select outputs um, and certainly in the, in the code of our system, we use expressions to mean those you know, expression trees that like one equals one and things like that. But in cascades, they're going to declare an expression to be a, uh, a high level op operation or operator in our system or in the query plan that's going to have zero or more or input expressions to it. So say I have my query here, select star from A, join A, uh, B and C together. I could have a logical expression that would be the join on, on A and B followed by the join on C. And then I could have a physical expression that would be the sequential scan on A, doing a hash join on the sequential scan on B, and then doing a nested loop join on a index scan on, on C. So, so an expression would be some, some uh, essentially the relational algebra uh, components for the query. But if I annotate them with these, these subscripts, I'm specifying what the physical operator I want to use to perform that, uh, perform that relational operator, right? So in this example here, uh, these two expressions are logically equivalent, right? So even though this is specifying the, the physical operators and this is just the logical operators, logically they're equivalent. They're both computing the join on A, B, and C. And so now we're going to be able to rely on this commutativity property to enumerate all the different join ordings as part of transformations to do exploration of, of, the, of the search space with this query plan and try to find, a, a, you know, find the optimal one. And this is what I was saying before when we talked about that left outer join, full outer join example. So in these case, I can move these, th move these operators around any way I want because they're commutative. But if I, one of these was doing a uh, left outer join or full outer join, then I would have to restrict the transformations to make sure that I do things in, in, in the correct order. But for simplicity in our example here, we, we won't worry about that. All right, so now, so now we have, so we have expressions and that's gonna be some sequence or some relational algebra expression. Now we're gonna have to define groups. So a group is gonna be the set of logically equivalent logical and physical expressions for one expression that, uh, that will produce the same output expression, right? So all logical forms, so essentially for a given expression, we'll have all logical forms and then we'll have all physical expressions that we can derive by uh, converting any logical operator into the allowable physical operators from the corresponding logical forms. So what I mean by this? So this entire unit here is a group. And this group represents the output expression of A join B join C. And then now we have the logical and physical expressions that are all going to be equivalent to, to this output expression here, right? So the contents of the group are going to be defined based on, on its output. And so I can't have a, another group with the same output, right? It's, it has to be unique to, to, to my, my query plan. Right. So also important to note that these expressions in here are unordered, meaning they, 
a, this is just sort of a, a illustration of what's being contained inside them. But just because this one's first doesn't mean anything about whether we should examine this one first. That's applied, or that's sort of computed as part of the priorities you would get when you do when you do your transformation. The other important thing to also point to is, as I was saying, in the case of volcano, for this output expression, they would have to generate all possible uh, all possible permutations of the logical expressions, and for each of those, all possible uh, permutations of the physical expressions. In cascades, these are sort of like you know uh, these are sort of computed on demand or just in time, so that I don't have to materialize every possible logical expression, and for each of those, every possible physical expression. I can say, I can apply my transformation rule and it'll generate some uh, equivalent logical expressions and I can determine whether I even explode them further and look at their, their physical expressions, All right? So this is, you know, this is, so this is what I'm saying. The, in the case of Volcano, since they were doing it all at once, the amount of state you had to represent here got really large. And so the on-demand thing is, is is the way we're going to sort of speed this, or way to reduce that state. But another optimization we can do in cascades is to use what are called multi-expressions. And the idea here is that instead of instead of instantiating exactly uh, the verbose form of all possible expressions for a given group, we can instead represent the uh, some sub-expression within an expression as a placeholder that is then represented by or taken care of by some group lower in, in, in the query plan. And so the, 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 the set of redundant expressions represented by uh, these placeholders in a group together is called, as a, is called a multi-expression, right? So in this case here, before I was saying A join B join C, and I was explicitly saying, hey, I'm joining uh, A, A and B, but now in the multi-expression, I just have a placeholder here that says, hey, uh, if A and B, they're being combined together. I don't know how. Somebody else below me in the query plan will tell you how to do this, but I know that I just have a placeholder here. And the same thing for, for in this case here, I have a, a scan on C. I'm not saying how to actually scan it. Uh, whereas in here, I was explicitly saying, you know, here, that one do a sequential scan. I don't have to say anything for that, right? So it makes more sense when you look at the physical ones. Right? The physical ones, I'm not, I'm not specifying how I'm join, joining A and B or how I'm actually accessing C but I am specifying that the, I have a physical join operator that's doing a certain merge here, right? And so the idea here, the reason why we're doing this is that in a top-down search strategy, like in Cascades, we can then make decisions about whether you want to traverse lower down into the tree uh, to understand how we actually want to join these things together, right? Without explicitly blow, blowing it all out. In the uh, the bottom-up optimizer, they're going to enumerate all the multi-expressions sort of from one group at a time in the order of the tables that they're generated. So they'll start with A, figure out how to maybe access that, then figure out how to access B, and then figure out how to access C, and then figure out how to combine A, B, and together, and go forth. So it's sort of, it's sort of a different way of, of, of looking at it. So uh, the... Before we can make decisions now, we'll see in the next slide, uh, or the next few slides, before we make decisions about how, you know, how, how we're actually going to do, you know, for this physical operator here, we have to make sure that for all uh, placeholder expressions we have below us in the tree, that we've, we figured out how we're actually gonna, going to access them, what's the best physical cost, uh, or best plan with the lowest cost for the physical operator below that in the tree. And then we can combine that together when we make a decision about which, which operator we want to do this for here. Again, when we go through the example, this will make more sense. So the last thing we need to understand in Cascades is the rule system. So again, a rule is going to be some transformation we can apply to an expression that will convert it into a logically equivalent expression, meaning it will produce the same logical results when we actually execute it. Right? And so we'll have two types of rules. We we'll have a transformation rule, which is a logical to logical, a logical operator to physical operator, or a logical plan to a uh, plan or plan subset to another logical plan subset. And then we'll have an implementation rule that will convert a logical operator or a set of logical operators to uh, physical operators. And as I said, every rule is defined by the pattern we will match to identify which sub plan or find a, a portion of the plan that has a specific layout or configuration 
that matches to our rule. And then if we find one of those, then we apply the substitution policy or the transformation that we want to convert the, uh, the query plan structure into the logical, logical equivalent change or logical equivalent um, uh, new plan. So let's look at an example here. So say this is our pattern. And our pattern is we want to match a subplan that has a equi join followed by another equi join. Uh, and then we have these placeholder groups where we're just saying we don't actually care or know, we don't need to know and we don't care uh, what these other groups are actually doing. We just care about having uh, sort of a left deep tree where you have an equi join followed by another equi join. So now, say this is a query that will match this. So again, I have now a group here that's combining A and B and joining with C. Then I have another here, another group here that's doing a, a join between A and, B, A and B. So these are both equi joins, assuming that you know you're doing a natural join. And then below that, below each join operator, I have these get expressions. Right? This is somehow saying, right, here's how I'm going to access uh, the, the tables A, B, and C. But we don't care what that actually is in our rule because we only care about having these two matching joins like that. So the first type of join we do is a transformation rule. Uh, the first like, change we can do is a transformation rule where we want to rotate the, uh, the joins to go uh, left or right. So in this case here, we're going to switch the, uh, the, 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 the join below the join at the top to now be on the right side of the tree, whereas originally it started off in the, on the left side. A uh, implementation rule would actually now be converting the uh, the, the logical operators for these joins into now uh, a physical operator that specifies what algorithm, algorithm we're going to want to use. So in this case here, we can convert these to be the joins to use a sort, sort merge join. So one thing we have to be mindful of in our system is that, or in Cascades, is that we want to make sure that we don't get stuck in infinite loops. So in the same way here that I have a, a transformation rule that allows me to go uh, that rotate the joins from left to right, I'll have another transformation rule that will convert it uh, from right to left. So unless I'm careful, I could just keep getting stuck in if a loop going left to right, right to left, and back forth over and over again. So we need a way to recognize that we've already applied a transformation, and therefore we don't need to do it again and, and possibly search what the query plan looks like after we apply it. So this is what the memo table or the memorization table in Cascades is, is going to do for us. So in the original Cascades paper, I think they use, they talk about using a graph data structure. Um, in our implementation, we use a hash table. As far as I know, in the uh, other open source Cascades implementations, they're also using a hash table. So what it's going to allow us to do is we can identify that we've, uh, we, we can identify that we have a group that we've visited before and therefore we don't need to examine it again because we already know what the query plan looks like after we apply that transformation. So that's gonna, so if we do that left to right, if we try, try to apply the transformation rule to go back right to left, we would say, well, we already know what that looks like because we've already been there and we see that cost in our, in our, uh, in our mem memo table, therefore we don't need to apply it. So what, how we're gonna do this is that we're gonna have equivalent operator trees and the corresponding groups store together uh, or store together into groups and we can store them in in the memo table and we just need a way to to quickly hash and identify that we have we have duplicates right so what this memo table is going to do for us is it's going to in addition to be able to uh, avoid duplicate co computations uh, and duplicate query plan uh, transformations we can also use that to be identify quickly that we've gone down now it's some part of the query plan and we don't need to traverse it any further. So this is tied to now this idea of the principle of optimality that Cascades is, is, is going to be based on. And this is from control theory. This is for this, the Bellman's principle of optimality. And this is not specific to uh, Cascades top-down search, but this is, this is how we're going to be able to you know, converge on finding, finding a, an optimal query plan. So all it really says is that if I... Uh, if I have an optimal query plan and it's comprised of two groups, then I know there can't be another optimal physical plan that uh, for one of those groups because if there was, then I wouldn't be the optimal plan. It's almost like a tautology. Like if I know that um, I know that this is the best plan I've ever seen, 
and I have the best plan I've ever seen and I'm at some point in the in my search tree and now I have a cost that's greater than the best one I've ever seen that I, that if I traverse down into uh, further down in my query plan tree, I'm not going to magically find the optimal plan that's going to be better than uh, the best one I've ever seen because then it, because the, the way the search works is that you're, you're adding more costs as you go down and you're not magically going to get less than what, what you've seen before. So and this is just the branch and bound search method for uh, solution tree. And this is just saying that like, we know that if we get to a point in, in our query plan that we have a sub plan that is worse than the best one we've ever seen, we don't need, don't need to do any further exploration on it. Okay, so let's look at now a full and an example uh, of, of doing a search. So let's say we want to do that three-way join between A, B, and C. Um, and so at the very beginning, I have this, this group up here that says that the output expression uh, should be A, B, and C. So the first step I need to do is uh, fire off a transformation rule that will generate me a, uh, a, a logical multi-expression. So here we have now A and B combined together, and then we're joining, joining C. So now what I want to do is traverse down into the tree and figure out, well, what's the cost of executing uh, of, you know, these two components of, of my, my expression? So I'll start down here. I'll take A and B. So again, now I have a new group where the output is, is A and B, because so that matches what my placeholder up here is. And same thing. Now I want to have a logical transformation or logical expression to represent what how to compute this output. So that's just now somehow accessing A and I'm going to join that with somehow some way of accessing B. So now same thing, I got to start with this first this first component of my expression and go down and examine how I'm actually going to access it. So my logical operator would just be get, get A, I'm going to access A. But I'm not saying actually how to do it. So I could have a logical to physical transformation to then say, oh, I could do an index scan on A or I, or, or I could do a sequential scan on A. And then now, at this point here, we have these physical expressions. There's nobody below us in the query plan tree, so we, we, can, we can compute the cost of what it's going to take to execute both of these. So let's say in this case here, the sequential scan, for whatever reason, is, is the cheapest way to execute this, this, the access method on A. So we're going to compute the cost with this, and then we update our memo table. It's cut off here, but this is just A, to say that the best expression we've ever seen for the, producing the output of just A is the sequential scan on A with a cost of 10. So now I can do the same thing, go on the other side, take B, I end up with this logical expression B, get B, I compute all the different physical expressions I could possibly have, sequential scan, index scan, the sequential scan turns out to be cheap, the cheapest, the cost of 20, I update my memo table and say, to access B, sequential scan is the fastest with the cost of 20. But now I come back up here and I can, up to, to back in this group here, and I can still start computing more logical expressions for, or generating more logical expressions to produce this, produce this output for me. Well, so now I wanna join B and A, because I, I did that rotation, right? Or I, I, I uh, changed the order. So now, same thing, I need to get the cost of accessing B, and then I get the cost of accessing A before I compute the physical cost of, uh, of converting this to a, a, a physical, uh, a physical operator. So, but in this case here, when I go down and say, well, what's the cost of accessing B, or what's the cost of accessing A, I've actually already done this, right? I don't need to do that because I already have the best cost in my memo table. So I don't even need to do this search again down here or apply more transformations. I'm done, and I just reuse the cost that I've had here. So I, can't, I could keep doing this, or I could, it's only A join B or B join A, there's only two choices. But now I can look at all possible combinations of what physical operator I want to use for computing the join. And here I'm only showing a subset. But now again, if I want to get this physical cost, I need to know what the cost of accessing A, I need the cost of accessing B, but I already have that in my physical plan, right? So the cost to save this one here to do in the SERP merge join it's the cost of accessing A, which is 10, the cost of accessing B, which is 20, and the cost of the SERP merge join, assume is 50, and now I can write that into uh, my memo table and say the cost of doing this is 80. So now here, I come back up to, my query, uh, to this group here, and now I need, need to examine the other side, accessing C. 
So same thing, jump down here. I can either do a sequential scan or index scan. Let's say for whatever reason, the index scan is faster. So uh, I record that cost to here being five. And then now I just, again, I can do more permutations of different join orderings of A, B, and C, or I, I can start examining uh, the, the converting the logical expressions into physical, physical operators and examining what are the different ways to access, to, to, do, to do the actual join. Um, and then I can then pick one that has the lower cost based on the summation of, of, of what I've done below me in, in the query plan, All right? So that's essentially how, how cascades works, right, at, at a high level, right? We just keep doing more and more permutations, uh, use the memory table as much as possible, but then we invoke the cost model when we have enough to do a, a estimation on the physical cost. And now it makes more sense what we talked about last time with the search termination. You could see how for really complex queries with a lot of joins, I could keep going really deep into my query plan and I could just keep doing the search forever. So you need a way to determine when should you stop. And we talked about how the wall clock time just says I stop when I run out of time, right, for a certain amount, of, you know, some configurable amount. I could have a cost threshold to say, like, if I, uh, if I find a, if I haven't found a lower cost, I haven't, haven't found a better plan that has been 10% better than the best one I've seen so far, uh, then I just should just stop because I'm, I'm sort of I'm getting diminishing returns on continuing the search. And then, you know, the last one would be if I can exhaustively search all different options, then I, I can just stop. So cascades is, as I said, uh, as far as I know, I don't think there were ever was a standalone Cascades implementation. Um, at least I don't think so. I think that uh, Gertz Graphy worked with uh, Microsoft in the 90s to implement Cascades in SQL Server. Um, and it's, it's best my knowledge, they're, they're, they're still based on that. But it's been used in a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different systems as well. And most database systems, as far as I know, are using the dynamic programming tech method. Um, but some of the newer ones in the last 20 years or so are, are using, some of them are using cascades. So Wisconsin O++ was like Columbia was a, sort of a standalone optimizer generator uh, that would, you know, you define the rules and would compute the, or generate the cost model or generate the optimizer for you. Um, Pivotal, uh, Orca, and CalSight are actually two interesting projects we'll talk about in a second, but think of these as standalone services that do query optimization. So you can have like your database system running one machine, your query optimization service running on another machine, and you send query requests over to the, the, to the optimizer service, it crunches on them, and then spits you back a optimal plan that you then execute. And so these, again, these are not, these two are not tied to any specific database system. The ones that are actually integrated in the system, again, SQL Server is pretty famous. Nonstop SQL is a, it's a distributed database, a parallel database from the early, 19, or early 1980s uh, that's still widely used today in a lot of banks and uh, financial systems. And so they rewrote their query optimizer in the 1990s. Clustrix was a, um, or is, it still exists, is a distributed version of MySQL that was bought by the MariaDB people, I guess two years ago now. Um, and according to their documentation, they use a Cascades optimizer to, to replace the, the original MySQL optimizer. And then our system, Peloton, which we started in the 2000s, we killed it off uh, two years ago, but since then, uh, 721 students have ported it over into uh, the newer system that you guys are working on today. So, um, and ours is open source. All right, let's talk about Pivotal, uh, or Orca and, and CalSite, because I think those are, like I said, these are uh, standalone optimizer systems that are not tied to any one database system. Uh, we did examine Orca in the very beginning days of Peloton decide whether we wanted to use it. They didn't have really good documentation and the way it worked was you would run the service and you had to send over these XML files that specified like the query plan and the rules and, and, and the, the catalog statistics about what the data looks like. But it, like I said, it wasn't very documented. It's gotten much better since then the last time we looked at it. Um, but at the time it was, it was not in the shape where we could actually use it. So Orca is a standalone Cascades implementation that was originally written for Greenplum. Greenplum was one of the original uh, data warehouse systems from the mid 2000s that came out with Vertica and uh, Data Allegro and Astro Data. And so uh, what happened was EMC bought Greenplum uh, and then VMware bought Gemfire or SQLfire 
and uh, EMC didn't want to have a database division. VMware didn't want to have a database division, so they both divested their database uh, products, combined them into a single company called called Pivotal. So. Orca was originally written for Greenplum, but then they broke it out and had to be a standalone system so they could then use it for their SQL engine on top of Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop file system called Hawk. So and again, it's agnostic what the actual data model is or what the actual database system it is. You specify through these XML files what you, you know, what rules you have and how it actually wants to, how it should actually form the plans. And then it's up for you in your database system to take those XML files when you get the response of here's the optimized plan and be able to execute it. So the one interesting thing about Orca that we haven't talked about here is that because it's a standalone service, you can imagine like I have my cluster of database machines and then I have one machine that's dedicated as the, the query optimizer machine. So that means that can, that machine can use all the cores or all the resources that are available to it to do query optimization. So they actually can do multi-threaded search. So how would that look? Well, in either way you're doing dynamic programming or the cascades approach, you could, it's easy to imagine that there's different points of the query uh, tree where I could fork off or spawn off different threads to do exploration in them. And they're, both, they're all using the cost model, they're all examining doing their own transformations. You still have to maybe update a global memo table to avoid redundant calculations or update, here's the best plan I've ever seen. But in, for the most part, the, the, the search themselves is, are independent. So they're one of the few optimizers that I know about that can do, uh, that, can, that, that is multi-threaded, which I think is kind of cool. And certainly our optimizer is not, it's, it could, our optimizer right now could run different queries, do optimizing different queries at different threads, but we can't take one query and do the search on, on multiple threads. So there's two interesting engineering things that came out of the, uh, that are in the Orca paper that I find uh, really fascinating that I haven't really seen discussed in other descriptions of optimizers. So the first is that uh, in Orca, they've set it up to enable them to do remote debugging more easily. So Greenplum is designed as on-premise software, so it's not running as a hosted service in the cloud. Like if you're a corporation, you download the software, the Greenplum software in Orca, and you run it on your own machines in your own data center. So now the problem is though, if now the optimizer breaks or throws an error, there's a, some problem with it, how, you, how do you actually debug that if you're now the Orca developers back and working in Pivotal? Because they're not gonna let you SSH into the machine and you know, rerun the, the, the query that failed or uh, you know, get a dump of the data and run it locally because it's, it's gonna be way too big. So what they did was they had it so that anytime that there's an error, the system would be able to dump out its state uh, in such a way that it made it, that allowed the developer to take that state dump, load it back locally, and be able to walk through exactly what the state of the, the, the system was, the optimizer was, when that query had an error. So that they can e easily re reproduce the problem and, uh, and fix it. So think of this as like a core dump for your optimizer where it has additional information like what was, you know, uh, what were all the transformations that I applied, what's in the memo table. Like it's more than a core dump, it's, it's sort of more, uh, it's more specific, customized to doing query optimization to, to make their life easier. And again, I have not seen this, maybe the commercial guys have this, but I have not seen this uh, talked about in, in other, other optimizers. The other cool thing they do in Orca, which I find super interesting, is that uh, they talk about how they have this testing framework that allows them to easily check that the cost model and the optimizer is truly picking the best query plan, the one that has the lowest cost. So they have this thing called TACO, which is the uh, testing the accuracy of the query optimizer. They claim it's open source. I, I haven't able to find it on, on GitHub. I, I need to email them. But the way it works is that, think of, think of like, I take, I, I take my query, I put it into the optimizer, and then it'll spit out what it thinks is the best plan. But I can also have it spit out what, it, what was the worst plan. And so now I can take the worst plan and the best plan, actually execute them on my database system and see, oh yes, it actually truly is that, that the best one is actually faster than the worst one. Now, in that case, you don't want to do, you know, that's two extremes. Uh, the worst one probably would be so slow that you don't want to do it. Like there's a bunch of Cartesian products. It'll take forever to run. That's obvious. So you ought to sort of narrow the gap of what the 
worst plan actually is, or the, the, the less optimum plan is, how many steps away from that is from the, the optimal plan. Like you take the best plan and the second best plan, run them and, and prove that the best plan actually truly is the better plan. This is something we want to do in our own system. We have the infrastructure and the optimizer to potentially do this. We just haven't built out the testing, uh, you know, the testing uh, framework to make it happen. So Orca is super cool. Orca was one of the first uh, standalone query optimizer frameworks, at least in the modern area era. Like Op++ and uh, and uh, Columbia were around from the 90s. But as far as I know, I mean, the code is online, but you know, it's it's it's, it's dated. Nobody actually uses it anymore. It's not maintained. Whereas Orca is actually being maintained. The other uh, optimizer framework that is actually more popular, I think, than Orca, uh, at least from talking from database companies, is this thing called Calcite. So again, this is another standalone uh, query optimi optimization framework that where you can specify, you know, uh, what what data model you want to use, what query language you're going to support, what the cost models are, and all the transformations you want to apply. And again, it just compiles them down and, and can do this all, all for you. So it originally came out of LucidDB. LucidDB was a Java-based database system startup out of the uh, late 2000s that failed, as many database startups actually fail, there's a lot of them. Um, but what came out of the ashes of LucidDB was the actual query optimizer, which then got open sourced as, as Calcite. Um, it's, everything's written in Java, and there's a, quite a number of uh, database startup projects, open source and closed source, that are interested in actually using using Calcite or, or, or actively using it or pursuing uh, the adoption of it. Um, some examples are like OmniSci, HerdDB, uh, Blazing SQL, Apache Hive, Splice Machine, and I know of maybe two others that, that have talked about it, that they want to start using this. Now they all use it to different, uh, to different levels. Uh, so this is, Calcite also provides you the SQL parser as well. So some of them is using to parse SQL uh, and Calcite has its own dialect. Some of them are using it to actually do the query optimization. I have not seen reports on how good it actually is. Um, but I think, again, this is, there seems to be a lot of traction around this because it's an Apache project, whereas Orca, uh, for whatever reason, maybe because Pivotal still owns it, that uh, as far as I know, only Pivotal is the one using Orca, even though it's open source. So I think for this one, this one you'll see a lot more in, in, in systems going forward. All right, the last optimizer implementation I'm going to talk about is from MemSQL. It's not anything um, mind-blowing. Uh, the reason why I'm bringing it up because they do one thing that's slightly different than, than the other optimizers we talked about here. Um, and this is probably because they're targeting a distributed, a distributed database system environment, which we've not really focused on uh, in, in the semester at all. But it's just worth, sort of bring, worth bringing up to understand uh, you know, the types of things people can do in their query optimizer. So it's going to have three stages. It's like the stratified approach. You'll have the, the, a rewriter that does logical logical uh, trans, trans, transformations, but these logical logical transformations actually can use a cost model. Then they're doing the logical physical uh, transformations, and this is mostly going to be the dynamic programming approach to do the joint reordering. But then now, then the last stage, they're actually going to take the physical plan that you get out of the numerator and then convert it back into SQL, but they're going to annotate the SQL with some additional mem SQL specific commands uh, for moving data that in a way that SQL can actually specify because again SQL is high level it doesn't say where the actual data is But now we're gonna add commands here to say like all right run this query But then send the data to this this uh, this particular machine uh, in, in, in your cluster So this part is super interesting that I've never really heard about in the uh, from an optimizer standpoint of, of doing this I've heard about this for testing where people take the physical plan uh, that's produced by their optimizer and then reverse it back into SQL and then see if you run that through the optimizer again, does it generate the same plan or, or, or logically equivalent plan? But I've never heard of this where they convert it back to SQL and then actually execute it and then parse it all over again. So this is, this is their pipeline for the query optimizer. And again, it looks a lot like the, what we talked about so far. You parse it, you bind it, then there's the rewrite or enumeration phase, but then you take the physical plan and then this planner thing converts it to SQL and then you send it to all the individual execution nodes who are then gonna do all these same steps all over again, except for this last one here, because now the idea is that we wanna have each local node that has the data to make a decision about how to actually do 
uh, the lowest levels of query optimization, like access methods, things like that. So the way to think about this is like, say I want to do a join, or say I want to do a, a scan on a table across five nodes. And on some nodes, maybe the data has a certain di distribution uh, that's different than other nodes. So rather than me in, in a global, have a, like a global planner, try to make a decision of what's the best way to execute this query on all five nodes, I'll come up with a high level global plan of how we want to move data around in this first phase here. And then I send the SQL query that I sort of regenerate back from the physical plan, send that to the lo local node, who then can now make a decision like, oh, now I know, since I have a, a, a more accurate view of what my data looks like because it's local to me, I can make a better decision on how I, I want to execute that plan on that node. Again, most distributed databases, as far as I know, don't do this last step. They take a physical plan and then ship that off to uh, all the in individual nodes, which so I think this, this is kind of interesting. Okay, so just to finish up, uh, the main takeaway you should get all out of all this is that we looked at the dynamic approach, approach we look at the cascades approach. These are sort of, again, two, two ways to, to, to sort of go at searching for a physical plan. Um, the, all of this, though, is going to make be highly dependent on having a good cost model. If you don't have a good cost model, it doesn't matter whether you're doing top down or bottom up, you're going to make bad decisions and just, it, it, the plans are just going to be, uh, are going to be terrible. And so we will see uh, next week, on Wednesday next week, uh, just how bad these cost models can actually get, um, in particular when we do cardinality estimations with joins. And so there's no magic way to, to make this work. And so when I say SQL Server has the best query optimizer, the research shows it actually picks the best plans, and that might just be because they have the best cost model and cost best estimates, okay? All right, so uh, let's quickly go through what's expected for you for the Project 3 code review. So again, as I said, on, on this Wednesday, as part of the project presentations, the project updates, uh, every group is going to have to send a pull request to the, the master branch on, on GitHub. So this will kick off a build on Travis. If that fails, you can ignore it, but it'll kick off a build on Jenkins, and that one we do need to pay attention to, um, and it'll also compute your code coverage. So for this one, your PR needs to be able to cleanly merge in the master branch. That means you want to do a rebase, get all our latest changes. S depending on when you guys forked the code from us, there shouldn't be that many changes. Um, and so what will happen is you'll go to the Google spreadsheet. I'll announce it as a Piazza. You put the link to your pull request there. Uh, then I'll sign you to another group. You guys go into the, uh, I'll, I'll give you one access on, um, on GitHub. You can go comment, do a code review on GitHub against the other team's pull request, uh, and I'll keep track of who, who's participating. And the idea is that when the pull request is done, uh, or the code review is done, in a week from now, the, the, the team that you reviewed will take your suggestions and take your comments and actually incorporate them and make changes into uh, into your code. And we'll do this around again, uh, another round of code reviews when, when we get closer to, or when we get near the end of the semester. So. Above all else, we should be. You want to, your code reviews to be helpful. You want to be courteous. You don't want to be um, overly disparaging or harsh up to your fellow students. Uh, so don't say like, "This is the worst code I've ever seen in my life." That doesn't help anybody. Uh, if you you want to give constructive criticism about uh, about about their project. So these are just again some general tips about how to actually proceed with the code review. So for the the group that submits the code review or submits the pull request. You want to include a summary and information about what files and functions and methods that you want the reviewing team to look at. So it doesn't help us if you have this giant pull request with all these changes, um, and some of these changes are a work in progress and you don't actually want feedback on them yet. So you want to, in your, in your, in your summary, you should provide information and say, hey, here's the list of files or here's the list of functions that, that you want the other team to review for you. Now, when you do the review, you want to try to limit yourself to only look at maybe 400 lines of code at a time and sort of set a max limit for any time you sit down to do the review to be up to 60 minutes because after after 60 minutes it just all becomes a blur and you're just leaving stupid comments or you're missing obvious mistakes right so you sort of limit yourself to, to looking at this amount of code at the time and then when you go into the do the pull request you want to have a checklist or sorry when you go into the code review you want to have a checklist on the side to say what is that is that you're actually looking for and how can you actually provide help so these are some things that 
uh, that I'm suggesting that you should look into or be, be mindful of when you're doing a code view. So above all else, obviously, does the code work, right? This should be, you know, should compile, should pass any tests that you ha that they would have uh, for their code in the pull request. Is all the code easily easily un understandable? Like it's not some, you know, arcane assembly code or weird intrinsics that uh, are not obvious. And make sure, so make sure that the code is, you know, people don't have these giant functions that do a bunch of things. Make sure that things are, are broken up into, uh, you know, nice composable chunks. We're going to avoid any duplicate code. We're going to avoid any commented out code. Uh, again, is the code modular as possible? There should be no global variables. We can't, I don't think we check for that, but it, you know, humanly, I think as a human, you have to check for this. Uh, if they have any debug output, do make sure that we're actually using the, this, the debug functions we give you. If you know print Fs, no standard C outs, right? Well, well the, the script will check that when you, when you submit the pull request on GitHub. But you know, in general, make sure that they're doing that, these things correctly. Everything should be documented, right? So the comments in the code should actually describe what is the true intent of the code. Um, all the functions should follow the Doxygen Javadoc format. And there's a check for this, when, again, in, in Jenkins, to make sure you, every function is actually documented. If there's anything weird that's happening in the code that's not trivial to understand just by reading it, make sure that's actually fully documented about what, what the expected behavior of the, the component of the system is here. If you're using the third-party libraries, make sure that it's an understandable why we're using that third-party library. Um, and if there's any code that's incomplete, you know, it, we should have to-do statements that are actually labeled correctly to say what it is they're actually doing. Testing is super important. Uh, the overarching rule about uh, your, your projects is that the code coverage should never go down for your tests. Um, your test should actually be meaningful. Um, so that means you just can't have your test you know, run through some code and then print the standard out, and that's how you're checking to see whether it actually did something correct, right? It should actually do rigorous checking to make sure that the functionality um, and the behavior is is operating correctly. So are the, are the tests complete? Are they comprehensive? Are they actually testing what they meant to be testing? Um, and we want to minimize the amount of hard-coded answers we have in our tests. Now, not all our tests work this way, but, uh, you know, if, if there's a way to derive what the correct expected output is without having to hard code a constant value, then that would be preferable so that if we, if we tweak your uh, test case, then we don't have a bunch of, you know, uh, erroneous errors or having to spend time to figure out what that new constant value should actually be. Okay? All right, so again, I'll post this on, these, these updates on uh, this information on Piazza and what's, what's expected for you, and I will discuss this on, on Wednesday this week at the project proposals. All right, so uh, for next class will be a new lecture on what are called non-traditional query optimization methods. And the idea here is to, to, now that we understand the background of like dynamic programming and cascades, or the core fundamentals of doing query optimization, let's look at different ways people can extend these techniques or try additional things to, uh, to improve the efficacy of our query optimizer. Okay? All right, guys, wash your hands. See ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was good.